Okay, it's 105 Eastern, so let me give a hello and welcome to those of you out there on the internet and also for any of the MIT folks that may be watching. So uh, today's lecture is kind of an interesting lecture. I'm kind of excited about this lecture because it looks like one thing, but it's kind of secretly another thing. So this lecture is continuing our module on, on what you might call data science and statistics, you know, the probability random variable sort of stuff that uh, on the one hand you might find in any statistics or probability class. But what this is really going to be about is, a, it's really a computer science lecture, but you may not see it completely. Uh, well, you will because I'll point it out. But uh, it's a kind of lecture that I'm not sure how often you would see out there, but we're going to talk about how to use types and, and what they're, the real power of using types. And in a way, I'm hoping that as you kind of listen to this lecture, you'll start to realize that, that what you're about to hear, you're gonna see in the context of random variables, but what you're about to hear can apply to just so many, many situations. So to sum it up, this might look like a statistics data science probability lecture, but in point of fact, it is absolutely a computer science lecture. And that's why, why I'm really, really excited about this, this lecture. So uh, maybe before I actually start the lecture formally, I think what I'm going to do is show you some docu documentation about the normal distribution from the computer language R. So I don't know how many of you have ever looked at the computer language R, but R has kind of been kind of known as the statistics language, right? That's the, the language that statisticians are often using. So here is some documentation from the R language about the normal distribution. Okay, here's another, I'll click on this other tab. Here is some documentation about another distribution that you may or may not have heard of, the chi-square. And what I want you to notice, and I will get back to this, but I want you to notice is that there are four functions that somehow are related to the normal distribution, but there's no normal distribution in R itself. Right, like what's wrong with this story? There's no distribution, there's no normal, there's no chi-square. All right, I want you to think about that as I start to play with some of these distributions. So in today's lecture, we really don't have that many, that much new Julia syntax, maybe none at all, maybe one or two little things. But what we have instead is one of the reasons why Julia can be so very, very powerful. Okay, and again, you're going to see this in the context of probability distributions, but I want you to think about how this could apply to so many other situations that you might encounter when you're designing software systems. Okay, so some of the words that you'll see today are, or, or the underlying ideas are how to organize code for abstract concepts. Um, there's Julia's concept of an abstract type. There's the concept of subtyping and building up expressions under the hood using types. Okay, these are fancy ideas. So give us a little bit of a chance to kind of expose them one by one. And I guess one Julia thing that, I say we almost don't have that much that's new, but I'm not sure if we've ever summed over an iterator before. And so that's one of the things that will show up today. Okay, but this is really about using abstractions in Julia's type system to, to, to really do some amazing things. Okay. Could you zoom in a bit uh, on your screen, please? What's the matter with the screen? Could you just zoom in a bit? Room more? Okay, it's already pretty big. How's that? Okay, yeah. All righty. Okay, so the very first, I don't know, maybe five or 10 minutes, I'm going to do random variables on the computer like any language can do. You won't see the difference with Julia at first. I, in some sense, I'm doing that on purpose because then I wanna see when I go back and do it sort of the cool fancy way, you'll kind of see the difference. All right, so we're talking about random variables. This is an idea straight out of probability, right? A, a random variable is an object which has different outcomes, right? Uh, for a discrete random variable, we assign probabilities. The probability that the random variable capital X will equal the value little x, okay? And the set of probabilities is what we call a probability distribution, okay? And just to kind of get used to it again, and I think we've already seen it, and I believe people are have some experience with Gaussian distributions and bell curves. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we drew a picture of a bell to remind you, but you know, in case you didn't see that lecture or uh, it, it's, it's reasonable to, 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 to kind of do it all over again. And so 
uh, a Gaussian distribution comes with two parameters. If I want to, to specify a particular Gaussian distribution, I need to just say two things. I need a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. Once I have a mu and a sigma, I have nailed down which Gaussian distribution I'm talking about. And if I could just play with the pictures, uh, the mu, you know, it's always this sort of bell-shaped curve as they call it. The mu will shift the curve to the left and the right, right? So the middle is the mean. So you can see the mean going from zero all the way to three and minus three. And by the way, if you're not making these kinds of pictures and sliders yourself, you're missing out on a lot of fun. I never, I always wonder whether it's as much fun to watch other people slide as it is to just do it yourself. So I really encourage you to sort of build these pictures. It's just great fun. Even if it's ideas that you know, I think every homework at MIT should have, in every class, should have you building like a GUI with sliders, but maybe that's too extreme. The, the, the standard deviation, maybe it's not too extreme. I have to think about that. The standard deviation, when it's small, it gets to be very narrow, almost goes down to a line as the stigma goes down to zero, or as the standard deviation gets bigger, it, it widens all the way out, right? And so that's how, how the standard deviation changes the shape of the curve. Okay, and when mu is zero and sigma is one, you kind of have the standard normal, that's sort of like the prototype normal distribution where they all, uh, where all other normal distributions can come from. Okay, so that's the normal distribution. And if you wanna generate data from a normal distribution, one way to do it is to take the standard normal, I'll remind you from last time that the Julia command for generating elements from a normal distribution is rand n. So the syntax rand n of 10 to the fifth, I'll remind you says, give me 100,000 samples from the standard normal, okay? And then when I multiply it by sigma and add mu, I'm actually now generating my data here, which is 100,000 long, are samples from a distribution of mean mu and variance sigma. So as I slide this, you see the numbers above me change, right? And so I'm actually getting new numbers each time. A new set of 100,000 numbers are being calculated from the distribution with mean mu and variance sigma, okay? And this is a very nuts and bolts way to generate normal distribution elements. Of course, you could ask, you know, what is the formula that, that draws this red curve, the, the bell curve itself, right? The data is being histogrammed, and so that's why we get these, these bars over here. But the formula for the bell curve, well, one way to do it is to write down the bell curve for the standard normal, that's e to the minus x squared over two with a square root of two pi constant on the bottom, right? And then from there, you can build up an arbitrary bell curve by simply evaluating the original bell curve you know, in a certain normalized way. You, you sort of undo this and you, you subtract mu and divide by sigma, right? And then you make the area equals one. That's what that does, right? So uh, you'll, you'll see other places where the formulas sort of all combine together, but this is sort of fun to do as well. Just show that uh, you could write, draw the, the bell curve, that's the red curve, not samples from the normal distribution, but the, the red curve itself, you can get by simply you know, shifting, uh, you know, on the x-axis, shifting and scaling the x-axis and the y-axis of the basic bell curve, okay? And so we could uh, evaluate the bell curve, say, at, at, you know, at mean zero and variance. Uh, let's see, what are we doing? We're evaluating it at zero when the mean is three and the variance is two, okay? So now the next thing I want to do is look at not just one Gaussian, but I want to add a couple of Gaussians. So there are a couple of reasons why I'm gonna do this. First of all, there's a remarkable property which you hardly would ever see for any other distribution, which is that if we add two Gaussians, something magical happens. Maybe you already know the answer, but something magical happens when you add two Gaussians. Let's see what happens when we add two Gaussians. So I'm gonna take uh, 100,000 Gaussians with the mean four and the variance 0.3 and another 100,000 Gaussians I'll generate, we're doing it by sampling, with mean six and variance 0.7, okay? And I'm going to add these, right? So this will be the sum of the two Gaussians. Maybe I'll make it a dot plus. Although, you know, a, a sum of two vectors and the element wise is the same thing. But uh, I'm gonna add these two vectors. So basically, one by one, you know, starting with the first of the 100,000, the second and the third, I'm just gonna add these two and then I'm going to plot the picture of the histogram. And look what has happened. This still looks like a bell curve, right? Magic, right? I mean, 
what are the odds? Well, when it's a normal distribution, the odds are pretty high, right? When you add two, that's the big, big statement about normal distributions, that unlike most distributions, if you add two normal distributions, the result is another normal distribution, right? It'll have a different mean and a different variance, presumably from the original two, but it is still the basic shape of a normal distribution, right? So normal distributions add in a very easy way. Uh, by contrast, most distributions add in a terribly complicated way. It would be very hard to write down, you know, you have to learn about convolutions and, and all sorts of things to write down about the, but, but the normal distribution, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, and so, um, so, so, so uh, here's the picture. You can see that it works out very, very nicely. Okay, and we could check that uh, the the sample mean, the sample mean is what you get by just taking all hundred thousand elements, add them up, and divide by hundred thousand. The sample mean you'll see is really pretty close to ten. So maybe no surprise. This had a four and a six we had for the mean, we had them up as 10. And the sample standard deviation is, um, is one, well, this is basically one, which means the sample variance is also one. Let's add the sample variance because we can. So let, let's add the variance rather than the standard deviation. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So let's get the variance, there it is. It's also about one, right? So four plus six was 10. 0.3.7, you could kind of guess the theorem if you didn't know it already, which is that if you wish to add normal distributions with a mean mu and variance sigma squared, you just add the means and you add the variances. Okay, so this is what these words say, that if you wanna add up two Gaussians with mean mu one and mu two and variance of sigma one squared, sigma two squared, then this is the new mean and this is the new variance, okay? Good. So just to stand back a second, I'm not really that excited about the normal distribution. I mean, the normal distribution is cool. I'm excited about Julia's type system, right? So just hold on, you'll see. Okay, that's what I'm really interested in. So let, let's talk about some of the things that one does, perhaps in a statistics class, right, with, with data. Okay, if you have a random variable, there are a couple of things you might do with it. For example, you would name the random variable like Gaussian, right? And you'll remember I objected because there is no, you know, Gaussian is a synonym for normal in this context. And I objected to this R because there is no normal or Gaussian object, right? There's just four separate functions that happen to have N-O-R-M in between with, with no real connection between these four functions other than what's in our minds, but not on the computer. Okay, so what would you want to do? You would want to name it uh, since these, since to be, to specify a particular Gaussian, you need the parameters, the mean and the variance in the case of a Gaussian. And uh, once you've named it and you know about it, then there's going to be a theoretical mean, right? There's a, there is an explicit mean that when you sample it, you hope to, to get a sample mean that's close, right? And there's a theoretical variance, which you could sample and hope to get the, the, the variance, right? And you could sum up some random variables. You could take products, you could do other things. And we could talk about that picture that looks like the histogram. That's what's called the probability distribution, right? And you know, you could, if you're doing it experimentally by sampling, we call it a histogram. If it's theoretical, we call it the probability distribution. Sometimes the histogram is called an empirical distribution because it's like an experiment, right? So these are all the sorts of things that probably would come up in a, in a data science, statistics, math course and probability, where, where, you know, I don't know, probably all three. Uh, and, um, and so you know, there's a reason why these various things have names, right? And so let's suppose, you know, um, we want to do this on a computer. Well, uh, here, I, here I brought up the, the, the links for, for, for the R software, right? That this is the chi-squared and the norm, the normal distribution. But let's go ahead and think about what we want to do. Well, if you were planning ahead, right, and you weren't just playing with Gaussians, but you were thinking for the long term, you were designing a system for the long term, then you would say to yourself, what am I really working with? Am I only going to be working with Gaussians with the normal distribution? It's like, no, we probably going to work with random variables today, right? And so that's like the big picture. So if that's something that is in your head, 
it's probably worth creating a type for it. Okay, and so we're going to create in Julia what's called an abstract type, which we'll call random variable. Okay, and uh, this maybe I don't know if we've seen this before or not. Maybe we could add it to the top. But this notation less than colon is how we're going to represent subtypes. It kind of looks like a I don't know. I mean, I guess a subset is sort of rounded, but it looks like a less. It is a less than sign. So it reminds me of subset, and that's what it looks like, less than colon, okay? And so uh, when it comes to random variables, it might be worthwhile to distinguish the discrete random variables and the continuous random variables. And I'll remind you that a, a discrete random variable takes on uh, discretely many numbers. It could be finite, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, or square root of two pi and, and the third root of seven, or red, blue, and green, I guess, as well. Or it could be infinite, but discrete, like the integers, right? As opposed to a continuous random variable, which takes on values like anywhere between zero and one or anywhere on the real line or something like that, right? And so um, what this Julia command does is it says, we're gonna define a discrete random variable as a subtype of a random variable. And we're gonna have a continuous random variable, which is also a subtype of a random variable, okay? And um, the great thing about the, or at least what I find convenient about Julia is you do not have to define any methods when you define the type. You could define the methods, the functions that you're going to use anytime you want. It could be later today. It could be somebody else who has access to your package and adds it. You know, you could do it three months from now. Okay. And so you don't have to in advance decide everything you're going to do with these things. But I have a random variable now. I even have a discrete random variable and a continuous random variable but I don't have a Gaussian, right? Just like the R people, for all my playing in the first, what, what do we have now? We're, we're, we're 17 minutes into the lecture, I guess. And it still looks like this right now, right? I still don't have what I really wanted, which is I really want to, to set up a Gaussian. So let's go ahead and do it. So here's my Gaussian, all right? It's gonna be Gaussians take on values anywhere on the real line, right? That bell-shaped curve, is, is actually theoretically can have any value on the real line, though it gets very, very small on the edges, but it's never a zero. So uh, it's, we're going to make it a subtype of a continuous random variable. We don't really need the subtype today, but it seemed easy to show you today and kind of worth doing today. So, but really, what, what does it take to specify a Gaussian? Well, as you've seen, it's a mean and a variance, right? So the symbol for variance is always sigma squared sigma being the standard deviation. Okay, so for a Gaussian, we need to specify the mean and the variance. And we've already seen that there is a concept of a default Gaussian, a standard Gaussian, where we would just take the mean zero and the variance one. Okay, and so uh, this way we could actually define a Gaussian that is just mean zero and variance one. It doesn't do much right now. With this code alone, I can't really do anything. I can't sample. I can't add two Gaussians. I can't uh, do very much, but at least I could define the thing, right? And so here I can go G equals Gaussian of one or two. And now all of a sudden I've got a Gaussian. I can't do anything with it, but at least I've named it. I mean, what can I really do? I mean, I guess I could grab the mean in this clunkyish way, right? I could grab the mean, ah, it's one or I could grab the variance. I mean, I could do that much, right? And this variance is two, but I really can't do a whole lot otherwise with this thing yet. Uh, but I've named it and that's a good start, okay? So what we'd wanna do next, of course, is add a mean, a theoretical mean method so I don't have to type it this clunky way. So that's what this does. Um, since mean is already part of the statistics package, it would be silly to define my own mean. So what this says is the theoretical mean for a Gaussian will be extract the mean from here, right? And so if I have a particular Gaussian, I can get the mean and I can get the variance, right? And so now typing mean of G and var of G does what I would want it to do. And it's kind of nice because it's sort of the same name as the statistics mean, right? And so we can kind of work with it theoretically, experimentally, right? There's a lot of choices here now that we can do. So that's nice. Um, now, I've done the mean and the variance for the Gaussian, 
What about the standard deviation? Well, you know, the standard deviation is always by definition the square root of the variance. So why not let's just think ahead and define the standard deviation for any random variable. You see, here I did the mean and the variance for Gaussians, but why don't we define the standard deviation for any variable to be the square root of the variance of that variable? You see, that's thinking ahead because now if I go ahead and define the variance for some other measure, for some other probability density, for some other random variable, right? I'm already ahead of the game. I've kind of like saved myself a little bit of work, right? This is always going to be correct. So why should I special case Gaussians when this formula is always correct, right? And so we often like to say that the secret to computing is knowing exactly when to generalize and exactly when to specialize. So for those of you who studied um, any advanced mathematics, you know that, that the, whole, the whole movement, you know, starting with the, maybe the beginning of the, the 20th century and even before that was to get more and more abstract. The feeling was that abstractions, the more abstract you are, the more you can cover in one fell swoop, which is true. But the mathematics somewhat lost sight of the special cases that are also pretty cool and very interesting. And so the, the whole attempt to move mathematics towards abstractions, which was really valuable, also came with a cost, right? And so the other thing you need to learn to do is to know when to specialize and when you, know, when, when you have the special case. And so a lot of computing is about knowing when to generalize and knowing when to specialize, okay? And so uh, we specialized over here and we generalized over here might be an example, okay? So now I could take the standard deviation and I think many of you will recognize this number as the square root of two, right? So if the, the variance of our Gaussian was two, then the standard deviation would be the square root of two, okay? Well, now I'm gonna do something a lot more fun. This was kind of straightforward, uh, but I'm gonna do something that, that is gonna look a little bit special, but you're gonna see just how powerful it's gonna be. I'm going to define something kind of crazy, which is the sum of two, Oh, wait, sorry, I'm not crazy yet. The craziness is coming below. Oh, this is easy still. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me take a deep breath. So yeah, this is still sort of easy stuff. I would like to be able to add two Gaussian random variables and uh, use the fact that Gaussians add in a simple way, right? And so the sum of two Gaussians, an X and a Y, would be a Gaussian whose mean is the sum of the means and the variance is the sum of the variances. Okay, and so here, if I have a zero one and a five six, I'll get a five seven, okay? And um, now I can actually check, I don't have to redefine the mean because the means define their normals. I could actually check that the mean of G1 plus G2 is the mean of G1 plus the mean of G2, right? So that I kind of like to, I love to say this sort of thing with words, like the mean of the sum is the sum of the means, right? There's when it comes to the normal distribution, that's true, right? The mean of the sum is the sum of the means, right? And I could change these numbers. I mean, I suppose I could have had a slider, but uh, you know, I could make these random numbers, right? So the, the mean could be actually here. We could make it random, actually. We can make these random. The variance better be positive, so I'll make it a rand. And you'll see the numbers changing, but this thing should remain true if mathematics is good, right? So. I'll do this a few times, you'll see the, the numbers change, but the true remains, right? So no matter what the means are, right? The mean could go negative or positive, the variance will always be positive, but the mean of the sum will always be the, the sum of the means. Uh, I'm not gonna do the theoretical product of two Gaussians because it's not a Gaussian. It's actually a complicated object. So as easy as adding two Gaussians is, Multiplying two independent Gaussians is, is sort of not, not that wonderful in many, many ways. So I'm gonna skip over that right now, but we may do that, the general case for homework, okay? Let's go a little further. Um, I guess I've already mentioned this, so I'm just kind of repeating it here, that the probability distribution of a Gaussian is explicitly this formula, but maybe it's worth showing that this formula is saying something specific. It is saying that the probability of appearing in an interval is exactly the area under the curve specified by this function, right? And so you kind of already know that, okay? But let's go ahead and define that as well. We can have the theoretical PDF for a Gaussian is the function, 
then if you give me X, we'll actually calculate this explicitly. Okay, and so we're building up all sorts of things about Gaussians, right? So um, I, if I just look at PDF of G, it's a function, um, but if I took the PDF of a Gaussian and evaluated zero, you get this number, which some of you might recognize. Do you recognize that number? I know the number. It's one over the square root of two pi. There it is, because that's exactly what would happen if this was e to the zero and sigma was one, right? It's, it's just this number over here. Okay. It's also the top of the bell curve, right? So it's, it's the top of this curve, okay? Um, so this is the theoretical curve we saw before. Okay, um, I want to get to the fun part. We're still not at the most fun part yet. So I just want to get there. Let's see. So, um, so, so um, let's see. We've got a bunch of functions to find on Gaussians. Uh, in a way, maybe it's good to sort of go back to this table of contents over here and see what we've managed to do and what we haven't managed to do. So, uh, We've named the Gaussians. We've got the theoretical mean and the variance. We planned ahead for the standard deviation for any random variable. We added two Gaussians. Uh, we defined the probability distribution. But the one thing that we haven't done was to find a sort of general random number generator. Of course, we have the built-in RANDN, but we could have a general random number generator by calling RANDN and multiplying it by the standard deviation and adding the mean. And of course, that's going to work as this histogram shows. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead. And now th this is where it gets a little more interesting. Let's, I've spoken enough about the normal distribution, right? You must be tired of the normal distribution. Let's bring in another distribution. We talked about in the last lecture, an, e an easier distribution, arguably, the Bernoulli distribution. That's the, that's the one that's, that's going to be heads or one with probability p and tails or zero with probability one minus p, right? So the, the Bernoulli, as you remember, is like the, it's just the weighted coin. I, I, I still never remember Bernoulli. I remember it as the weighted coin. And if you ask yourself what is needed to specify a particular Bernoulli distribution, what do we need? What do we need for, a, you know, like before we needed the mu and the sigma squared to specify a particular normal distribution. What do we need to specify a particular Bernoulli distribution? Well, there's only one thing we need, which is the, the parameter P that's gonna be between you know, zero and one, right? We just need this one parameter P, P, and we've got the Bernoulli distribution, right? So here I'm giving an example where it's Bernoulli of 0.25. Now, of course, at this point, with this much code, all I've done is named it, but haven't done anything else. But we can go ahead and specify the mean, which I think is obviously P, right? Because it's with probability P, you're gonna get a one, right? Otherwise you get a zero, right? So the mean is, is P. The variance you can calculate as well. Um, you, it, you, you could just take the, you, you, could, you could just see that uh, uh, for, 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 for the variance, you, 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 you know that it's, you could subtract the mean, so you get one minus p and minus p, right? And then you would multiply the one minus p by p, and the one minus p gets multiplied by one minus p. Anyway, when the smoke clears, what you get is p times one minus p, which is what we see over here. Okay, and again, standard deviation will just work because it's been made to. Um, we could define the RAND function now on the Bernoulli. And now what I'd like to do is add two random variables, right? I want to add two random variables where, you see, before the normal distribution, when I added two normal distributions, I got a normal. But when I add a normal and a Bernoulli or two Bernoullis, you know, something else is going to happen. How do we see what happens, right? Well, let's actually go ahead and define a type for the sum of two random variables. This is a little bit overkill, but in a way, what should we do if we add like I, what I want to do, you know, I'll, let me kind of show you, I want you to think about it. I would like to be able to do like a, a Gaussian of, it doesn't even matter what, four comma five. And I want to add that to a Bernoulli of 0.3, right? Now, until I define the, this thing, it doesn't exist. 
you know, in, unless you define this thing, the computer is going to say, I don't know what this is. But does that bother you? Because in your mind, you know exactly what this is, right? You take a random sample from here and another random from here, and you add them, right? Your mind knows exactly what this means, but the computer doesn't know what it means. So what could should we do? We, we need a way of, of adding these two things, right? And I mean, we already know how to sample from the sum, but we don't have something to express the sum. And so this is where you need a type, right? And so we're going to say a sum of two random variables, which is made up of a random variable and another random variable, OK? And now I can add random variables, right? So I've got a Bernoulli. Let's say B1 is a Bernoulli. Here's B2 is another Bernoulli, say. I mean, we could do anything. and. Um, if I want to add two random variables, I now have something to say about it. It's a sum of two random variables. I mean, this almost seems like a tautology, but it's not. It's telling the computer that if I have one, if I want to add this object and add this object, I have some place to refer to the answer. Okay, so if you want to sum two Bernoulli's, we can go B1 plus two B2, and you see what the result is. It's a sum of two random variables. Right, so it doesn't do much, but but it does everything. It stores the pieces of the sum. Okay. Uh, however, if we know that if we have two Gaussians, when we add it, right, we actually get a new single Gaussian. So is this already starting to seem kind of cool? Maybe I should like take a deep breath and tell you what just happened. This very same plus is adding random variables. When it saw that it was two Gaussians, it was, aha, I know what to do with two Gaussians. I'm just going to make it a new Gaussian by adding the means and the variances. Oh, I'm going to add two Bernoullis. I don't know what to do with two Bernoullis. I mean, if I added two Bernoullis, like zero and one, I could get two coming up. It's not a Bernoulli for sure. I don't know what it is. You know, it's got another name maybe, but it's not a Bernoulli. So already we could see that we could add random variables and when we know what to do, we could specialize. When we don't know what to do, we could sort of keep the sum running, right? And, uh, but at the very least, we could say that if you have the mean of a sum of two random, random variables, you get what's the so-called linearity of expectation. That is the mean, we could, we could define it so that it's the sum of the means, right? This, is, this now says that um, the mean of a sum is equal to the sum of the means for any sum of two random variables. Okay, so that'll always work. So now I could go mean of B1 plus B2 and it'll add up the means. Uh, it's practically looking like symbolic computation and though there's nothing symbolic here, this is entirely numerical computation, but it, it has the appearance of, of symbolic computation, okay? And by the way, the variance we could define as long as we know that they are independent and I'm not gonna make too big de a deal about it. I mean, maybe we should have a new type called sum of two independent random variables, but if they are independent, it's known that the variance is also add. Um, and if we wanna sample the sum of two random variables, then you just take a sample from one and a sample from one, the other. All right, so let's start playing with this now. Okay, and so for example, I could now, with ease, you see, this, this is sort of the magic of computers. You do a bunch of setup, and then all of a sudden, you could spend the rest of the day playing with it because you could just see what happens. You have your own little laboratory set up. So what happens if I added a Bernoulli here? Let's, let me do a Bernoulli of 0.5 and a Bernoulli of 0. 0.5 for starters, okay? Well, then we're going to get the possible, we're, we're going to get zero, one, and two, and there's like twice the probability of getting the one, right? It's sort of symmetrical. If on the other hand, I did Bernoulli like this, then um, the one is gonna come up more often, or so, right, yeah, the one's gonna come up more often. You can see how it changes. But we could start playing more fun things. We could take, let's take a Bernoulli and a Gaussian, all right? I don't know, I, you don't see this in books as much, but we could take a Bernoulli and a Gaussian and you get a sort of, you know, two hump thing, right? It's got two, two peaks, if you like, right? This is called a, this is sometimes called a mixture, right? And so 
Um, you've got all the technology now to add these sorts of things, right? You could take any Bernoulli and any Gaussian and sum them up and see what they look like, right? You could add a slider if you want. Um, you could, you know, you could just play with this thing and see, you know, all the different things that you might have, right? This is sort of symmetrical. This kind of looks nice, I guess. Um, so you could play with this now, right? You've got you've got power, right? You've got mechanism now that you can do lots of different things by because you invested in the type structure, okay? But you're gonna say, you know, that's a kind of cool, I guess. You could do two random variables, but what if I wanted to add three random variables? Do I have to go back to my type and say sum of three random variables, right? And then, you know, but then you start getting greedy. Am I gonna need a four or five? I mean, it seems a little cumbersome. The answer is no, we're actually done, right? Sum of two random variables is all you need, right? Because I can actually add or Bernoulli a 0.25, look, I just added them, right? And I used, this, 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 is, this is really where the power of abstraction comes in. If you, if you add three things, that is the same as adding two things, right? And then iterating and taking the sum and doing it again. So as long as everything's defined, which it is, you could see that it, Without any extra definition, I actually can add three things just by using plus, right? So, I mean, here's the breakdown of it. It's a sum of two random variables where the second thing is a Gaussian, right? And the first thing is itself a sum of two random variables made up of two Bernoullis, right? And so you can sort of see the stack forming. Um, for those of you, this is, I guess, a too, maybe too fancy a word, but you can see the abstract syntax tree almost in action, already almost in action. Right, so how cool is that? We can add up three of these things and define, we could call this a mixture, right? And we could generate a random thing from this mixture because we have it, we, could, we now have the ability to generate random numbers from this sum, right? And we can histogram this mixture, right? Because we have it, right? So I could go on and add some more. I could add on another Bernoulli, I don't know what it'll do, but we could add on another Bernoulli. Uh, I don't know, let's try 0.1. I have no idea what it'll do. Uh, maybe we should make it larger, I don't know. You know, anyway, whatever you do, you can play with it and it will histogram that thing. And so, uh, you know, when I think of static textbooks, you know, you might see a couple of pictures, but in this sort of laboratory, you could take any distribution you want, add it to our list, and then all of a sudden you can play with the histogram. Okay, that's where the power of the type system comes in, okay? And um, by the way, this, this, you know, our brains are so used to the fact of associating the symbol plus with the sum, right? So what is plus? Plus is something you do on two, you know, you could, you could extend it on more objects, but you add up, two, plus sits between two objects, right? I mean, that's, I, almost always we think of plus as sitting between two objects, right? The sum command applies to a collection of objects. So we've defined plus, but we didn't define sum, okay? But Julia knows what a sum is. A sum is a sequence of pluses. So you don't have to, like, you know, maybe in some other programming language, I don't know, you would have to redefine sum on Bernoulli's, but no, with, 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 with Julia, I can just sum up all of these Bernoulli, say Bernoulli 0.25 for i in one colon 30. There's nothing that makes it that I have to have the same parameter p. I could go s is the sum of rand. Uh, yeah, a rand, a random probability for i in one to 30, it, it wouldn't care. All right, but let's go back to 0.25 just to make my point, right? So I've now just added up 30 random variables and I've defined a new variable, okay? And I just wanted to point out that this is not a vector, this is, Right, so this, this is a little different. It's slightly different. I don't know if you'll see the difference, but this is slightly different from, from sort of an expression like this, though it kind of gives the same answer. Um, but I just want to show you the difference just the same. So here's a sum of a vector of size three, okay? Here is the sum of an iterator of size three. And the difference is for this one, three wouldn't matter, but if this was three million, you would have to store the vector first, which would cost you a lot in performance. Um, here, when you add it up, it actually doesn't store the entire vector um, as you go. It may stick it in the syntax tree, 
but it doesn't actually store the entire vector. And so you have the possibility of keeping your memory small, in, at least in principle, maybe not exactly in this case, but in principle. So let's get back to my main point though. Let's go back to my sum of 30 Bernoulli's, right? So, so I hope you remember what this means. I am rolling 30 coin tosses, but these, these coins are unfair. They're probably of heads as a quarter. I'm doing 30 coin tosses, and I kind of want to know what might happen, how many heads might come up. And you can see, here's the histogram. I just go histogram of S. This is exactly what's going to happen, right? So, uh, and this is a theoretical answer in some sense, right? It's not an experimental, it's not a simulation, right? Uh, this, uh, wait, is this, this one was a simulation. This one was a simulation, right? This is an experimental one, sorry. Yeah, this is this is this was done. Uh, but, you, but you could calculate a an, an actual uh, theoretical version of this curve as well. Right, we could, and maybe we'll even do that for our homework. I think we were thinking of doing that. That's right. Um, this is so. The reason why I tripped on that, and I'll apologize, is it looks so good. I can't even tell the difference. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 kind of why I, I tripped. Um, Right, and we could take the mean and the variance um, and grab random objects from S, right? And so here you could see, I could sample from this. And I think that this is a big deal, right? And I don't know if I can stress that enough that with just a little bit, I mean, maybe we should go back and see what we really defined because I, I did a few things to try to give you an idea. And then there are things that were truly necessary. And if you see what was necessary, uh, you find out that it wasn't very much. I mean, basically, I defined specifically the, the random variables normal and uh, Bernoulli, right? The Gaussian and the Bernoulli got defined, okay? And they were both subtypes of, of one was a discrete, one was a continuous random variable. And in turn, those are type, subtypes of, of random variable, okay? I defined the mean, the variance, and how to generate them, not much more, and how to histogram them. And that was enough to be able to draw these beautiful pictures, right? And any, any distribution I want. And so, uh, you know, in a way, when you talk about adding distributions, it feels very abstract because, you know, what is a distribution? It's something that I can take samples of whenever I want to, right? But you see, I can just add them. I can refer to the sum uh, anytime I want. Let's see, what any other good ones I could do? I mean. I suppose if I added another Gaussian, it would just look like a Gaussian, so that wouldn't be that interesting. I don't know. I could try something. I don't know what it would do. Yeah, see, Gaussians kind of overtake. Maybe a small, a smaller variance would be more fun. Maybe that's too small. You have a, another distribution down lower in the notebook. Yeah, that's coming. All right, fine. Um, I was wondering if I could get more pretty pictures up here, but that's okay. All right, so let's do in the last you know seven minutes, let me talk a little bit more about using information when you have it, right? So the sum of Bernoulli's when the probabilities are all the same is actually something that we know a lot about, all right? It's yet another, this thing actually has a name and it's easy to work with. And so let's might as well talk about it. Oh, whoops, are we not doing that one? We're doing the chi-squared? Uh, oh. I thought we were going to do the binomial. All right, whoops, 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 whoops. Scratch that. We ha Let's talk about a different distribution. Starting all over, we were going to do one, but we here it, uh, we mentioned the Bernoulli's, but we're not doing anything with it here. Ah, okay. Let me tell you, let's add a third distribution. What do we have so far? We've got Gaussians and we've got Bernoulli's. Okay. I would like to add another distribution, one that comes up a lot in statistics, the so-called chi-squared distribution, right? And so some of you may have heard about chi-squared tests. Um, if you took a data science class or a statistics class, you would have learned how to test for significance with these chi-squared tests. You might have even learned to make these tables and, and, and you know, nobody really understands these tables. Well, I guess some people do. Um, but uh, let's talk about the chi-squared distribution. And I'm gonna play a game similar to the game I played before. I'm going to come up, I'm going to start with a kind of generating distribution, and then I'm going to get other chi-squareds from one of them. 
So I'm going to start with the chi-squared one, right? And stats classes, that might be called chi-squared with one degree of freedom. All right, so I'm going to start with the chi-squared one distribution. One dis so the first thing I need to do is name it. And there really are no parameters because the one degree of freedom is already built into the name. So let me define the chi-squared distribution. And I'm going to do it. Let me, the first thing I'm going to do is tell you how to sample from it. So chi squared one is actually nothing other than the square of a Gaussian, the square of a standard normal, right? And so that's all it is, right? If I take an ordinary standard normal and square it, I get a chi squared one distribution, right? So before I was talking a little bit about multiplying two independent Gaussians, right? Here, I'm multiplying the same Gaussian by itself. It's like the extreme opposite of independence, right? I'm taking this Gaussian, I'm multiplying by itself. It's it's the ultimate independence, I guess one might say. So I've got this chi-squared distribution and um, we could try to plot the histogram. It's kind of, there. Th this is what it, it looks like. I mean, I guess I could, maybe I can um, see if Wikipedia has a better picture. I could change it myself on, but here just to show you, yeah, the chi-squared distribution is with, the, with the one degree of freedom is this black curve right here. Okay, this is this black curve right here. and. Um, on a different scale, this is the very, very same curve, okay? Now, what I would like to do is get to the chi squared n, the, the n degrees of freedom. I mean, we only have the black curve. I'm gonna show you that you can get the blue curve. Let's, let's see, are there other pictures here? No more pictures. All right, let's start with this. You can get the, the blue curve, the green curve, the red curve, and the purple curve. Oh, this is the test statistic. What I really need is the actual distribution. Oh, come on, let's see. Yeah, there they go. That's what I'm really looking for. This is the picture I wanted. So to be, I think I said something wrong before. This yellow curve is what we're seeing on a different scale. And the question is, can we see these other curves? The, with two degrees of freedom, we've got the green. With three degrees of freedom, they have the cyan color, whatever, teal, whatever that is, blue for four. Um, six is purple, red is not, the nine is red. Can we get these other ones? Well, I claim that we have everything we need. You don't have to type in formulas. All you have to do is, for example, I could histogram the sum of four chi-squareds and I will get the, 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 the histogram for four. In other words, I'm actually getting the blue curve. It's at a different scale, but I'm getting this blue curve just by adding four chi-squareds, right? Or chi-one-squareds. So two would look, again, a slider might be fun, but we have all the technology right here to sample and histogram all of these different ones. And you, you can see the character changes with one, it kind of goes to infinity. Um, two, it, it still just sort of goes, it's sort of monotonic. Starting at three, it goes up and then down, right? And it kind of moves to the right as you go. So, uh, so the general chi-squared distribution is, is uh, nothing more than a sum of chi-one squares. And, See, we have the technology to just build it right here. All right, one other quick thing that I just want to show you real fast. It's kind of a little bit of a side story, um, but the interchange of actual symbolic computing with numerical computing. So um, Julia has a symbolic package that's in the works. Um, it's, it's, it's moving very quickly. I mean, it's not as, it's not completely as extensive as some other 30 year old packages might be. Um, but it, it can do quite a lot. For example, you could define variables such as mu one, sigma one squared, mu two and sigma two squared. These are now symbolic variables. And what's cool is you can stick these symbolic variables in, uh, into the Gaussians that we defined and we could add them and it'll just work, right? And so um, mu one and mu two will be mu one plus mu two, sigma one squared, you know, here's 17 and three, you see it just works. And so, um, this is really what generic more, you know, another further example of what generic programming is about the abstractions where you can, you can stick in floats, you can stick in integers, you can stick in symbols, right? And instead of the thing breaking, the thing still works. And when that happens, it's just such a joy to see that, you know, you weren't planning to do symbolic computing, you were planning to do numerical computing. Oh, but it works anyway, right? And so we'll have more to say about symbolics. But I just wanted to give you a peek about uh, symbolics right now in Julia and just show you that it just works, right? I mean, when, and so 
you know, and that's the real power of a computer. Not to, you know, I, I, if I, if I could sort of sum up what I think is, is truly important, um, you know, I see lots of people programming, you know, doing solving a problem on a computer. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I do that all the time myself. You solve a problem on a computer, but the computers get really, really exciting when you can build classes of problems, ultimately build a system that could solve lots of problems. And if we could only just make it easy to do that, which is what we're trying to do with Julia, then th that's where the true power of computing really comes from. So with that, I will end my micro century. And I guess I will say goodbye to the internet audience and stick around maybe for a little while with the MIT audience.